Okay, we're going to be taking a look today at the beginnings of the progressive era. And this is the era that is going to follow the industrial age and looking at some of the fixes that we try and have to some of the problems that are created by the industrial age. And to get this started, I want to look at this quote by Ignatius Donnelly. And he's kind of taking stock of where the situation is um, in the late 1800s, around the turn of the uh, 20th century. Talks about corruption dominating the ballot box, the Congress. And he ends off by saying here, we breed two great classes, the paupers and the millionaires. And I think that's something that we've talked about fairly extensively, how America's middle class is kind of vanishing during this age of the industries. What we're going to take a look at with the progressive age is how do we fix some of those problems? Now, looking at the Gilded Age, and when we talk about the Gilded Age, we're looking at this time from the 1870s to the 1900s. And the reason why we call it the Gilded Age is because this term literally means it's a false brilliance. So what we're talking about is, well, on the surface, we see the industry and guys like Carnegie and Rockefeller taking America to new heights. Um, we also understand that there are, again, a lot of problems. Uh, the political corruption we've discussed, the fact that industry is creating a lot of problems, maybe as many as what is, um, maybe creating as many problems as what it's doing as far as improvements. And we also understand, even though we haven't talked about um, social changes yet, the impact that African Americans and women are going to have during this time period. And Mark Twain in his book, The Gilded Age, talked about this um, with the corruption that existed. He said, unless you get the ear of a, se a senator and persuade him to use his influence, you cannot get employment in the most trivial nation, uh, nature in Washington. One of the things that starts to happen is, you know, we have this spoil system where guys get jobs um, simply because they helped the center and they, um, you know, maybe persuaded him or, you know, flat out gave him money. Those are the kind of things that are only going to allow people to get uh, jobs in Washington. So that's one of the issues that, again, this uh, progressive age is going to seek to fix. Now, problems of the Gilded Age. And understand, when I say Gilded Age, we could say Gilded Age or we could say Industrial Age. And those terms are totally interchangeable. So if I say Gilded Age, I'm talking about the Industrial Age. I say Industrial Age, I'm talking about the Gilded Age. It's one and the same. These are all things that we talked about in class. Obviously, we have the fact that workers were being incredibly mistreated. They were facing long hours, um, working incredibly bad conditions for very little money. Um, farmers, one of the things that we're going to get into later in this lecture is that a lot of farmers were running into problems, and that's going to have um, really kind of the first effort um, to, to deal with fixes. Uh, poor political leadership, political corruption. You had guys, uh, Boss Tweed, who was out of New York, um, was incredibly corrupt. You had guys who were overcharging the city, overcharging the taxpayers. Uh, tweeted, as rumored, um, was paying $500 a bench to put in New York Central Park um, simply because, you know, it was costing about 40 bucks. He put the rest of it in his pocket. And obviously, we understand how city living um, was becoming just an absolute disgrace at the time. So now we have to try and see, okay, these are all the problems that have existed. Now what are we going to try and do in order to fix them? The first effort or first movement at reform is populism. And the Populist Party is formed in the 1890s, and William Jennings Bryan is the, the party's presidential candidate in the 1896 election. And he is a guy who really speaks to the common man. He really believes that we need to really refocus things in Washington and, and try and make some changes from where we've been the last 30, 40 years. One of the things that he was really big on was taking the country off the gold standard. Uh, what we mean when we talk about the gold standard is we were only supposed to have as much paper or coin currency um, in production, in circulation, as what we had gold to back it up at Fort Knox. Well, that's fine, but the problem is that if you're doing that, you really limit the amount of currency and coin that you can print. And that, in some ways, is going to make it very tougher on the farmers of the Midwest. They aren't going to have near as much to... Uh, to spend on their crops. And he talks about this in his Cross of Gold speech. You know, he said, uh, if you look over here on the left, says, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind on this cross of gold. And the point he's trying to make there is that keeping the country on the gold standard is hurting its populace. It's hurting its people. So we need to look at other options um, to set our economy up. So with that, in 1892, the Populist Party issued as a document that really kind of underscores what they stand for, and that's called the Omaha Platform. And here's the major ideas of the Omaha Platform. 
One, they are very much in support of labor unions. And we've seen in the 1890s, labor unions are maybe not the most popular thing in the world because of all the violence that happens. Civil service exams. This goes back to what we talked about with Twain's article where he said that the only way you could get a job in Washington is to have the ear of a senator because it was all about a buddy-buddy system. Now we want to make sure that people are actually qualified to do what their, jo what their job is going to have them do. The free and unlimited coinage of silver, we've already talked about that. A progressive income tax. What that means is that if I make $10,000 and my neighbor makes $20,000, he should be paying more in tax than me as a percentage. Maybe I'm only paying 5% of my income in taxes. Maybe he's paying 8 We want to have direct elections of senators. Uh, before this, senators were chosen by state houses. So obviously, you have the opportunity to run into some corruption there. We only wanted to allow the president to have one term in office, and we really wanted to campaign for that eight-hour workday. Of course, the eight-hour workday is something that we've talked about um, quite a bit. Obviously, that was one of the major causes of the Haymarket Square um, impact. All right. Well, populism has an initial target audience that um, is a fan of it, the common man. The problem is they just really can't have any political support, and part of the reason why they don't have any political support is because William Jennings Bryan gets looked at by the Democratic Party after his cross of gold speech, and they realized, this guy's pretty good. We need him on our team. So they named him the candidate for their election. They don't end up winning it anyway. But the important thing that we have to understand about populism is that while it in and of itself doesn't change anything, it affects zero politically, a lot of the ideas that the Populist Party created, the had our work day, the civil service exam, the silver idea, are things that are in 10 years really going to change the thing. And this is a quote, a historian made this quote on the Populist Party. said that it's the beginning of a movement that in another decade is going to change the face of politics in this nation. So we're starting to see the initial beginnings of the reform movement. And the populism doesn't isn't able to get it done, but it's the progressives eventually that are going to be able to get it done. And again, they just carry on. They're really the Populist Party. As you see historian William Allen White say here, the progressives are really just a Populist Party that shaved its whiskers, washed its shirt, put on derby, and move on up to the middle class. So making the reference that the Populist Party really kind of catered to the farmers, the, the laborers, the progressives are a little bit more middle class, okay? That's kind of where this whole thing is going to start. Now, the big thing, again, the populists do is they see this idea that maybe we can improve our country. Let's try and figure out what we can do. One of the things that a lot of these progressives are going to be is heavily influenced by religion. They felt like a lot of, you know, that Christian teaching that people are basically good, that we can make the world better than what it appears to be today. So with that, let's try and figure out what changes can we make to the world around us? How can we fix this industrial age? Now, some of the issues that the industrial, um, of the industrial age progressives are going to tackle are going to be, one, they want to have political reform. They want to expand voting. When we talk about expanding voting, the number one group they're trying to get um, into the uh, booths, uh, so the voting booth, so to speak, is women. Women is still at this time do not have the right to vote. Civil service reform, it's what we've already talked about. The fact that the cities are a disaster, you know, there's, uh, there's filth, there's waste, overcrowding. Reducing the wealth gap. What we mean when we say reducing the wealth gap is it's that goes back to that quote by Donnelly at the very beginning of this where he said we have two classes, the millionaires and the paupers, or the rich and the poor. We have very little limited class. So what we're trying to do is balance that out a little bit. And obviously, one of the things we've talked about extensively is how do we improve working conditions um, in this time. Now, one of the ways that the Gilded Age and all these problems are going to be uncovered are these muckrakers. Now, when I talk about a muckraker, a muckraker is nothing except a socially conscious writer who is going to try and uncover some of the injustices and the political problems that exist in our country. So all these muckrakers we're going to be talking about, these are going to be guys we're going to get more in depth in class with, are writers. They're individuals who are going to do research on the cities, on the businesses, on the problems, so on and so forth. Now, the reason why they're called muckrakers, actually interesting, Teddy Roosevelt, who's going to be one of our uh, great progressive presidents, said that they actually focused uh, too much on little uh, things in life. You know, they, they raked around in the muck, so he said... But these writers um, are going to probably do as much as anyone is uh, to uncover the problems in the progressive era. And some of the legislation stuff that we're going to see later on adopted, it, it really all comes back to these guys. Because if you don't have these problems uncovered, then it's tough to address them. 
So the muckraker is absolutely critical in the fact that they are going to help uncover all of the problems that are existing within the city. Okay, that wraps up our notes for today. Uh, make sure we have these notes taken. You're ready to turn them in in class. Thank you.